Good afternoon and welcome to Education and the Politics of Identity in East Asia Today, a La Trobe Asia webinar uh, presented in collaboration with Kyushu University as part of Kyushu University's Asia Week. I am Beck Strading, the Executive Director of La Trobe Asia at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. I would like to begin the event by acknowledging the elders of the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which La Trobe University sits. And I would also like to pay respect to their people, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who might be watching this webinar this evening. So part of our role at La Trobe Asia is to engage the public in meaningful discussion and debate and to deepen our understanding and knowledge of the Asian region. Uh, nationalism and identity formation have long been complex and contested processes in the East Asian region with serious political and social implications uh, within East Asian states and for regional order, cooperation and stability more broadly. In many societies, rising inequality feeds fear and resentment of immigrants and legacies of or memories of empire and colonialism have fueled resentment uh, of foreign interference in some states. So in tonight's webinar, we'll be looking at the relationship between education and the politics of identity in East Asia. What role does education play in shaping ideas of identity and nationhood across this region? To what extent are citizens taught to see political identity as something diverse and complex? And what are the implications of different approaches to citizenship education? And should we see education as a potential tool for promoting national reconciliation or as a dangerous weapon for inciting hatred and division? So these are some very important questions and here with me to try and untangle some of these pressing issues is our expert panel. Uh, first, Professor Kari Okano is a Professor of Asian Studies and Japanese at La Trobe University. She researches the sociology and anthropology of education and inequality, women and multiculturalism in Asia, particularly focused on Japan. Welcome Kauri. Hello. Professor Ed Vickers is Professor of Comparative Education at Kyushu University. He researches contemporary history of education in Chinese societies with a particular focus on the role of schools and other public institutions in political socialization. It's great to have you here, Ed. Thanks very much. Cheers. And finally, we have Professor Tzu Bin Lin, who is an Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at the National Taiwan Normal University. His research interests are in education policy and leadership, media literacy, comparative education and TESOL. Thank you for coming along tonight. Thank you. It's my pleasure. There will be an opportunity for audience Q&A in the second half of this webinar, uh, for which we will be using Slido. So please do go to slido.com and enter the code hash J774. You can see I've usefully put this up uh, behind me. Uh, you will be able to ask questions, which everyone can see on Slido as the discussion is taking place. And you also will be able to vote on questions, which I encourage you to do, uh, because the most popular questions go to the front of the line. Uh, so it's quite a democratic system we have for audience participation tonight. Uh, but let's get straight into it. I might start with you, Carrie, uh, with your sort of expertise uh, in, in uh, Japan, education policy in Japan. How does the Japanese government try to instill a certain national identity through schooling policies. Thank you. Um, the Japan project itself, or Japan is seen as a very centralized uh, place in terms of education policies, but it's not necessarily the case. But of course, national government has its own goal. And we can see this in three different ways. One is a legislation called the Fundamental Education Law, which was introduced in 1947 and revised in 2006, which set out the, the goals of education. 
And one of the things that they say, and it was introduced in 2006, after the controversy, was the love of your own country and the land, respect for traditional culture, etc., which the leftist argues returning to the patriotism of the, uh, the pre-war period. The other thing is the national curriculum guidelines called the course of study, which lists the kind of things that needs to be covered in each year of schooling. Uh, in history, one has to, you know, you have to cover X, Y, Z, and so on, so on. And this is revised every several years. The latest was 2018 and 2019. Former was a primary school and the latter was a middle school. And based on this national guideline, curriculum guidelines, and this is my third point, is the school textbooks. Now, this has been discussed quite widely outside Japan. The school textbooks are screened and authorized by a committee appointed by the Ministry of Education. There are about approximately about 20 commercial publishing houses, and they appoint groups of academics and teachers to write textbooks based on their expertise and based on the national curriculum guidelines. So there's a range of progressive, conservative, Japan-centric, uh, more global-centric, and so on. And it is up to the local government uh, which textbook they want to choose. Uh, uh, one particular company it has been very controversial in that uh, it was argued, it was claimed that that provides uh, a very conservative um, right-wing view of the history. Um, I must say that comparing the textbooks that are uh, uh, used since 10 years ago with those used 30 years ago, things have changed quite a bit. For instance, in history textbooks, there is a perspectives of indigenous Ainu and Okinawans, a human rights activism of former outcast Buraku people. Uh, in a history book, there is a perspectives of Koreans being forced to receive colonial education in Japanese. They list quite widely that, that the death toll of World War II was much greater in China than in Japan, although the Japanese tend to go on the victimhood mentality or victimhood uh, discourse of history. So um, also there's a description of the new migrants uh, in Japan in the, in the textbook of geography and demography. So there has been a change, but to what extent this has had an impact is open for, for a debate. So if I'm following correctly, Carrie, um, the local governments can affect, they choose their own textbook and they can choose more progressive or less progressive versions of history that suit their own constituents. Is that right? Exactly. So what so, happens in the metropolitan area, they tend to choose uh, the ones that, for instance, metropolitan area, they might have more migrants or more minority people. So they will be more sensitive to um, the community needs. So yes, so, so the local government do choose the textbooks out of these many. That, that are not, really not only the social studies, but English language, Japanese, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also, um, the, for the senior high school, it's, it's an individual school decision to choose a textbook. For instance, academic high school may want to choose a, a more advanced level of mathematics than the vocational schools, which may not consider advanced mathematics is not that appropriate for the kind of subject that they're running. I wanted to, to ask you about that, about how, you know, you've got this overarching picture of educational policy. How is that implemented at the, the school level? Uh, what sort of agency do teachers have or do schools have uh, when it comes to uh, delivering education policy? Uh, and have these uh, education policies, are they effective in achieving these goals around um, national identity and, and um, you know, creating a particular version of history? Well, I don't think um, creating a particular version of a history, I don't think it's been all that successful. And this is partly because of the school teachers. 
Um, I have observed uh, classroom practice in Japan, both as a researcher or as a parent. The, what happens in, in, within the wall of a classroom, no one knows what's happening. I mean, there's no inspection. There's no inspector going around to check what teachers are doing. So a particular kind of textbook can be used differently depending on what teacher want to do. Teacher may want to use a particular description within a textbook as a source of critique and so on. So there is a, a great deal of agency at the level of local government and then in particular within the school. Um, and at the end of the day, I think uh, how effective uh, the goals of the government is achieved is depending on the teacher quality, what the teachers do. Um, in the case of Japan, uh, with the, uh, in response to um, the critique of the pre-war education system, in particular teacher training, the all teachers are trained at university. While in the pre-war period, it was, uh, it was trained in that so-called normal school, the teacher training college, which was uh, removed from the university, whereby the critical thinking uh, was not encouraged. Now the all teachers are trained at the university, so they are, to a greater extent, are more critical of what they're doing. The, in terms of the discretion that the local government has, uh, they, need, they are more uh, accountable, they have to, they are forced to be more accountable for the needs of the local need. You know, civil group might make a petition for the, for say for instance, new migrants who need a Japanese language as a second uh, language education, which school may not have had before, but they have to, local education board have to respond to these uh, on the ground, ground level requests. And therefore, they tend to be more accountable to what actually takes place on the ground level. Really interesting. I might turn to Taiwan now. Uh, Tsubin, unlike Japan, Taiwan has a unique political status uh, in relation to the People's Republic of China. So I'm interested, how does the Taiwanese government try to uh, instill uh, national identity through schooling? Uh, and does its unique political status play a role in efforts to cultivate a particular uh, understanding of Taiwanese national identity? Okay, regarding the issue of national identity, I think in Taiwan we definitely uh, have a very strong impact on different political ideology. I mean, uh, before 1987, Taiwan was under martial law, so uh, the impact from that time onwards till like mid 1990s, Taiwan was uh, the whole history and national identity is highly uh, direct towards the Chinese and nationalist uh, kind of like identity. So the textbook all cover, uh, I mean the history textbook, the Chinese textbook are all about China, Chinese literatures and uh, Chinese history. And things start to change in 1997. That is the very first time in primary and junior high school level, there is a textbook called Understand Taiwan. Yeah. That is the very first textbook focusing on introduce Taiwanese geography, Taiwanese history, and some Taiwanese local culture. Before that, uh, I mean, those things, I mean, local cultures or local dialects are kind of forbidden in schools. Uh, when I was in primary schools, actually I was, uh, at that time, the primary school teachers, they forbid students speaking their own dialect, I mean the mother tongue at home. At school, you can only speak Mandarin. Otherwise you will get punished if you speak your mother tongue. Mm. Yeah. So that is what happened in 1980s and 19, early 1990s. But after 1997, I mean, under Li Denghui's presidency, things start to change. We, uh, the education start to put more emphasis on local stuff. Mm. including mother tongue language. So uh, in the, about 2004, when the grade one to nine integrated curriculum guideline was introduced, um, 
the dialect, the mother tongue, become one of the subject in primary school. So that's a huge change in the education system because it represents uh, the respect to local culture. Okay, so from that time on, uh, more and more uh, changing, changes in education try to foster a more Taiwanese identity, if I can address that, like uh, you use this term, like Taiwanese identity. And it's kind of like uh, against a kind of a, a super big uh, Chinese identity uh, that, uh, that was very significant uh, pre mid 1990s. And then uh, after that, in 2006, uh, the Taiwanese history and geography was firstly introduced to senior high school. And remember from year 2000 and 2008, it's under uh, Chen Shui-bian's presidency, it's DPP party. Taiwan, there are actually two kind of major parties representing two different ideology. KMT is chi Chinese nationalist. DPP is more like a pro-independent, try to have a local Taiwanese identity. So in 2006, all the Taiwanese history and local stuff was introduced all the way up to senior high level. So from that time on, uh, uh, the younger generation do have certain impact from their education because uh, based on the uh, longitude uh, survey done by the election study center at the National Zhengzhou University, they study save survey from 1992 all the way till now. So every year they do this survey and they are asking uh, people questions. Do you consider you are a Chinese or you are a Taiwanese? Mm -hmm. Okay. And in uh, before 2007, most of the Taiwanese, uh, I mean, more than half of Taiwanese actually consider that uh, we are Chinese or Chi both Chinese and Taiwanese. But 2007 is the turning point. Those people, after 2007, those people identify themselves or answering, answering that uh, we are Taiwanese. That is the very first time uh, the percentage is over those who consider they are Chinese. So 2007, it started to change. And gradually, uh, especially under younger generation, for example, this year, uh, during the age cohort of 20 to 29, more than 80% of them in, in this cohort, 80% of them consider they are Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. And the percentage, if we move to those who are above 40, is about half and half. So you can see the, well, the younger generation, they are more uh, tend to identify themselves as Taiwanese. And if you put this together with the change of the textbook and uh, in the education system, try to introduce more Taiwanese stuff, including dialects or uh, Taiwanese history. Even in the latest uh, curriculum guideline, especially for history one, uh, the Chinese history, uh, uh, the portion of Chinese history was uh, hugely cut. So we, we only start to introduce what happened in China after Tang Dynasty. So that means Han Dynasty and those uh, the romance of the three kingdom were no longer exist, existing in the current history textbook. Actually, it caused a, a, a public debate recently taking place in Taiwan. Some history teachers complaining that if we don't study the past, how can we know who we are now? Because China, uh, the history of China actually was put into part of the a bigger uh, historical arena called the uh, history of East Asia. And then we inc increase the portion of Taiwanese history. So that is the most recent curriculum guideline. And the textbook actually was uh, already published and the schools start to use that. But still, we, are, they, they, we still have debate on this. But apparently you can see once the curriculum guideline changed, the textbook changed, and it definitely has certain impact on younger generation. 
Fascinating. Uh, I would like to get back to the role of Beijing in this and uh, China, but we might park that one for now because I'm going to ask you a follow up. Uh, and it's the same question as Cowrie about um, how these uh, political decisions are implemented at a local level uh, and whether or not uh, I think you have actually already answered uh, this question, whether or not these policies or efforts are effective. It certainly sounds like uh, yeah. they have been. Yeah, uh, because uh, unlike in Japan, in fact, in Taiwan, it's the individual schools. I mean, the subject teachers can decide which pub, which, mm. which textbook they are going to adapt. So it's, it's a school, school decision. Mm -hmm. So the local authority actually they don't have the force to ask school to choose which version of or which publisher's textbook they are going to use mm -hmm. but because we have a curriculum guideline from the central government that means uh, all the textbook content need to be consistent to the curriculum guideline so if they the curriculum guideline is saying that chinese history is part of the history of east asia then the textbook publisher need to uh edit the textbook further that direction. And we have a National Academy for Education Research. They don't have the right to veto the, 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 the publishing of textbook, but they do have the right to issue a license to the publisher. So they review the uh, textbook and make sure the content of textbook actually is follow the curriculum guideline. That is how the central government tried to make sure their policy, especially the curriculum policy, can be fully implemented at the school level. And I have to say, uh, most of the Taiwanese teachers, especially the younger generation in their 20s or 30s, even early 40s, they do have their uh, agency in how they interpret the textbook content. And usually the principals and even uh, other teachers may not get intervened in what happened in this particular teacher's classroom. Mm. So if we take a history, uh, the, this subject as, example, as an example, there are still some teachers, they are kind of like a, a pro-Chinese nationalist ideology. But I have to say probably the percentage getting less and less. And they, when the younger generation floods, new teachers go into the schools, when they were educated, actually, it's more like uh, moving towards uh, constructing a Taiwan identity. Mm. So probably for those teachers, they will welcome this kind of change in history textbook. Because uh, they try to bring in more uh, contents from uh, the history of East Asia, try to connect Taiwan to the rest part of East Asia rather than relying on the uh, relation solely on China. Yeah. So I mean, uh, the textbook is definitely has a strong impact on how, what, what the teachers uh, are going to teach. Yeah. I'm interested to know how Hong Kong uh, compares with the Japanese and Taiwan experience. So uh, Ed, I'm going to, to ask a similar set of questions to you, but about Hong Kong, because uh, Hong Kong obviously has its own unique relationship uh, with China uh, and so uh, whether or not um, Hong Kong policymakers try to cultivate a particular national identity uh, in reference to China or uh, you know a, a particular understanding of history um, through education policy. Right there's a short answer and a long answer to that. The short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> But the, so I, now I, I was a, a school teacher myself in Hong Kong in the mid 1990s uh, and I taught history uh, amongst other things. And back then there was no Hong Kong history taught in Hong Kong schools. It's like the situation Zubin has just described for Taiwan. And then in 1997, uh, at the same time as Taiwan, and of course at the same time as Hong Kong returned to Chinese rule, uh, there was a reform to the history curriculum and it's to some extent coincidental that this happened at the time that Hong Kong returned to Chinese rule. But the history curriculum for uh, secondary schools changed and from that point Hong Kong history became a part of the curriculum. Although interestingly it did not become a part of the curriculum for a subject 
called Chinese history. So the Hong Kong curriculum is divided for history between Chinese history and history. Chinese history in Hong Kong has always been about China from the center. Uh, and so Hong Kong is seen as this little pimple down there on the chin of the great Chinese state uh, of, of limited importance for you know, someone who's interested in the history of China as a whole. So Chinese history as a subject community, the teachers, the people involved in that, were not really interested in teaching Hong Kong as part of their subject. So it went into the other subject that's conventionally referred to as world history. But the perspective on Hong Kong history that was taught through this, uh, that subject was, I think, quite different from what we find in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, you know, why was Taiwanese history introduced into the curriculum? Uh, what were the sort of motives behind that? It was very much to do with uh, emphasizing, um, strengthening a sense of Taiwanese distinctiveness. Now, to some extent, those motives were also there in Hong Kong. They were in the air in Hong Kong in the 1980s and 1990s. You know, as we have seen, Hong Kong identity is very strong. Mm. But the government is not accountable to those Hong Kong people with that strong sense of Hong Kong identity. The government since 1997 has been accountable to the center in Beijing, and increasingly so. So superficially, what we have in Hong Kong in terms of the way that the curriculum is controlled is a situation very similar. Well, actually similar in many ways to what both Kaori and Subin have described for Japan and Taiwan, in that you have a textbook approval process, but the textbooks are produced by private publishers. In Japan, they're chosen by local education boards. In Taiwan, they're chosen by schools. In Hong Kong, textbooks are chosen by schools uh, from a list of approved texts. But who controls the committees that do the approving? In Taiwan, it's democratic. In Japan, I would argue rather less so. In Hong Kong, not at all. Uh, and um, one interesting feature that we should note of the national security law that was introduced in Hong Kong several months ago is that it refers specifically to education. It refers to education as something which under the uh, aegis of national security uh, is something that the central government representatives in Hong Kong are going to have to take an interest in. And this is, gonna have, this, is, this is an area that now is going to be directly supervised, mm. not, not necessarily controlled in every detail, but it's going to be supervised with an eye to national security. Now, to understand how we've got to that point, I think you need to look back at the agenda that to some extent Beijing has also had or always had for Hong Kong, which has been to transform Hong Kongers into patriotic Chinese citizens. So Be the Beijing government has never recognized the legitimacy of uh, a sense of a distinctive Hong Kongese identity. That sense has always been there since 1997, but it's never been recognized as a legitimate thing. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to ask you uh, about, you, you're sort of talking about, it, it is quite a different example from Taiwan because you've got a government in Taiwan that is pro-independence or, you know, that they're wanting well, to... Well, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on which party's in power. But, but <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So they're, they're, they, are <laughs> accountable to, they are accountable to a population which is, you know, overall and, very much tending towards... Uh, and sense. yes... So that's the, the sort of the basis of the, the question that I wanted to pose to you, because you've got a situation in Hong Kong, which is, is different. You've got um, a, a government trying to implement a particular policy. What about at the local level where you've got people who might be teaching in schools that do have a really pro-independent Hong Kong uh, sense of identity? Hmm. Um, so well, how does that... So, so your question is about sort of effectiveness <laughs> or, to some extent, or, you know, so how is this implemented? What effect does it have? Yeah, yeah. And Subin said in the case of Taiwan, and I think rightly, that the changes to the school curriculum in Taiwan have had some effect on the consciousness, particularly of young people. You know, they're exposed to a lot more discussion of all aspects of Taiwanese history, society, and so forth when they're at school. Now, but, but if you go back further in Taiwan, 
yeah, to the martial law period, that wasn't the case. Hmm. Yeah, what would what 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 was Subin learning? Little Subin when he was at school <laughs> he wasn't, learning, wasn't learning about Taiwan. He was learning about oh, our oh, country, nothing. China. Now I I can't speak for Subin, but if you look at if you assume that what's in the curriculum sort of gets absorbed by uh, these little these children at school as if they're little sponges then how do you explain the fact that since the 1990s, Taiwan has reacted against all of that Chinese nationalism and has taken the direction that Tsu Bin was describing? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you have to look at whether the messages that the government is trying to promote actually chime with the lived experience of the people it's trying to influence. And in Taiwan in the 1980s, Telling people that you know, your country is China when hardly any of them have ever been there uh, mm. and when it's governed by a regime that's completely different <laughs> from what they experience <laughs> on Taiwan is alienating. Mm. In Hong Kong, it's also alienating uh, to be told that you, know, you are Chinese, this is your country, uh, and, and to be also to be taught Hong Kong about Hong Kong history and society but perhaps to be taught about it or to be, you know, uh, on the receiving end of messages about Hong Kong from the government, which do not chime with your experience, especially if you're a young Hong Konger. So the, the Hong Kong government, ever since 1997, has been tasked by Beijing with promoting national education. And increasingly over the last decade or so, this, this pressure on Hong Kong from Beijing national education, what's going on? Why are these young people not patriotic? You know, reinforce, strengthen national education. Um, but the young people who took to the streets in 2012, in 2014, and from last year, are the generation who, which has only received education uh, under Chinese rule, yeah? So if national education was gonna have any effect, they're the litmus test. <laughs> and they are the proof that it, it has had the opposite of the intended effect. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and just one more thing. I mean, it's, it, we, we should bear in mind that, so, so I mean, we've reached uh, the situation we're in this year in Hong Kong as a result of a sort of series of protest movements over the last 10 years, or eight years, really. Uh, where, how did those protests start? Um, they started in 2012 with a protest movement that was specifically directed against an attempt to introduce a subject, a compulsory school subject called moral and national education, uh, which was basically designed to deliver the Beijing vision of national identity to all students in Hong Kong. Students themselves in that year took to the streets and said, we, we, we reject this, we refuse to accept this. The government backed down. Mm. And, and many, it's many of those same students who have gone on to protest for democracy, to protest against the, the um, extradition law last year. And, and so, you know, education is, and the battle over education in Hong Kong has been central to the story of Hong Kong politics in recent years. Mm, that's fascinating. Uh, so we have talked you know, a bit about uh, the role of China, but I was going to get back to you, Kauri, about um, the idea of a kind of pan-East Asian order being inherently uh, Sinocentric. Uh, what does this mean for, for nation formation in, in particular states and the specific elements that feed into identity construction, including language, but also including history um, and how we, we understand the big contests and battles that have taken place in East Asia uh, through centuries. Yeah, well, um, the people in Japan makes a, quite a distinct distinction between Chinese civilization and PRC political system. And I would say that that the Japanese civilization has an affinity to ancient Chinese civilization. Um, and many aspects of the ancient Chinese civilization has become part of Japanese culture and daily lives. That 
could include the Chinese characters that the Japanese began adopting in 6th century AD. Japan was an illiterate country until then. They imported Confucian ideals, Buddhism, etc., etc. So people actually experience this element of ancient Chinese civilization every day, often unconsciously, and also they learn through schooling as well. For instance, calligraphy is compulsory as part of Japanese subject. There's a subject called Nihongo Japanese, and part of it, they do a calligraphy. Part of it, they learn Chinese classics. They read Confucius, etc., Chinese poetry in ancient Chinese language. It's not that you, know, you read in a translation into modern Japanese. They actually look at the Chinese text and then they learn how to read them in a Japanese way, not the Chinese way. So, so they don't see these Chinese classics at, not necessarily as a foreign thing. They see it as a part of uh, a part of Japanese literature, Japanese culture. So in that sense, I think there's certainly a sense of uh, Sino, ancient Sino-centric civilization that actually prevails in contemporary Japan. But there's definitely a distinction that they make from the, the current PRC regime. And I think that the, the Japanese, ordinary Japanese citizens are very sensitive to the authoritarian political regime in comparison to Australia, uh, precisely because they actually experienced it uh, and to, during the war. So they've experienced authoritarian regime where there's no freedom of speech, no freedom of association, et cetera, et cetera. And now that they have a benefit of uh, enjoying liberal democr democracy, although there are some inadequacies and limitations in there, uh, I think they are very sensitive to uh, what they see in the PRC political system. So my answer is that, yes, I think there is some element of uh, ancient, uh, ancient uh, Chinese civilization centric uh, idea there, in, in when we talk about East Asia. Uh, it's only that Korea, it doesn't use the Chinese character, the, the rest, Hong Kong, Taiwan, mainland China, Japanese, Chinese character. It's like a Latin and Greek in Europe, I would say. The, the, the Chinese characters have higher social status and intellectual status in Japanese writing. Mm. And therefore my name, my, my name, Kaori, is in Japanese phonetic alphabet because it's considered as feminine and somewhat unintellectual, less intellectual. But you won't see boys who have uh, Japanese alphabet names. So I think it's still, it's not that, you know, my parents are very conservative, but it's still, I think, it's, it's still experienced in, um, in a daily life. Mm. So it's so interesting. Um, Subin, I might bring you in here for this question about the sort of Sinocentric nature of East Asian and particularly trying to, um, you know, create distinctiveness uh, and, and, the, and the use of, of, of language and history and, and so on. But also hoping to, to uh, ask you another question alongside that, uh, and that is whether Beijing has had any attempt to influence um, Taiwan's education policy as it sort of um, tried to increase a, or, or cultivate a sense of distinctive Taiwanese identity. Okay, so if we go back to the Sinocentric kind of ideology or cultural identity something, I mean in Taiwan, I mean before mid-1990s, as probably as Ed just described, actually uh, what we learn is mostly overwhelming Almost overwhelming is from uh, traditional Chinese. Traditional Chinese culture, we need to do calligraphy. And even when I was, uh, when, I, when I served in the, because in the past, all the Taiwanese male need to serve in the military for two years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those things uh, from school all the way to, to, to the mini, mini, military camp, uh, the base, Actually, uh, uh, a lot, we have a strong influence of Chinese culture at that time. But after mid-1990s, the government tried to play down this part. And I can give you an example. 
they lower the percentage of traditional Chinese literature in Chinese textbook. And they start to kind of like, uh, to me is a kind of uh, constructing a special category called Taiwanese literature. So that means those uh, Taiwanese writers, uh, probably under Japanese colonial period, they start to use uh, Minanese, lang uh, the pronunciation of language and Chinese characters, write novels, blah, 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 blah. But at that time, you know, when those Taiwanese writers write about this literature, they actually, they are resonate to traditional Chinese culture. Because at that time, it was under Japanese colonial period. So these uh, literate uh, individuals, mm. they want to reconnect to the so-called traditional Chinese culture, even though they are, uh, they are, they are, their writing is in Taiwanese in the dialect, they, they are using a dialect to write it. But actually it's kind of like having this kind of connection, tracing back to the, to the traditional Chinese culture. But uh, I mean, the, the first DPP government tried to play up the status of uh, Taiwanese literature and make it as a contrast to so-called traditional Chinese literature. Mm -hmm. So they increase the, the, the percentage of Chinese literature in Chinese textbook in Taiwan. So, and they also encourage universities to have, uh, to set up new departments on Taiwanese literature and Taiwanese languages. Mm -hmm. So it's the way they are, they are constructing that, the, the distinctiveness of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. We, we have our own literature. And at the same time, they also claim that Taiwan in its, uh, when, when Taiwan first appeared in the world's uh, stage, Taiwan is a multicultural society. It, it never a uh, Chinese, uh, even though the, uh, the ethnic group, the majority are Chinese, but cultural wise, Taiwan is multicultural. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, people from Netherlands and we have people from uh, Portuguese coming to Taiwan. So more and more, the name of Formosa is, is widely used in Taiwan. Mm. Because it's in, in, in the early days, that's what Taiwan was called. Then uh, also they put emphasis on that. We, you see, we have a lot of ind indigenous people actually living on this island long before Chinese come to Taiwan. We need to value their culture, their languages. And even now the government put a lot of emphasis on the new immigrants because by doing so, yeah, Taiwan is actually a multicultural society. We, we welcome immigrants. We have new immigrants. So, you know, under the most recent curriculum guideline, new immigrant language is also allowed to become a subject one of the three choices for primary school students to learn. So there are seven uh, different languages from Southeast Asia because many of the new immigrants are from Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. So the government tried to portray that, okay, in Taiwan, we have more than one national language. All the opportunity languages, even Taiwan sign language, sign language are the national language. Mm -hmm. So. Mandarin is only one of them. And together with Minanese and Hakka, the two Chinese dialects, and nearly 14, one four, uh, Aborigine languages and Taiwan Sign Languages, they are the so-called national language. So you see, in the past, uh, Mandarin is the only national language. It's a share with a strong link to China. But now we got more than 10 national languages. And also the government introduced the bilingual policy in this, uh, in the past two to three years. So English probably in the foreseeable future, maybe 10, 15, 20 years will become one of the official language of Taiwan. So they are promoting, uh, but the legitimacy to have English is to internationalize, yeah, to connect to the world. So fair enough. But you see in Taiwan, we have, uh, they use language policy also as a means. What are, the what are our national languages? We have more than 10 national languages. We are a multicultural society. I think this is 
how the government construct this idea, uh, this idea and try to teach the younger generation through education. So at the same time, if we have more than one national language, it undermines the dominant uh, status of Mandarin Chinese. So uh, it's kind of like shifting the, the landscape of national identity. And yes. furthermore, I mean, the, the yeah. percentage of those who identify themselves as Chinese. I might pass over to Ed just before we get to Q&A and, and get your input yeah. here. Well, I mean, so what, what the, the picture that Subin is painting basically in, in, in the case of Taiwan is of a government, uh, well, and society using Asia mm -hmm. and multicultural elements largely from Asia uh, as a way of portraying Taiwan as something other than Chinese. So multiculturalism in Taiwan and diversity becomes folded into this um, message that Taiwan is not simply Chinese. It's more complicated. It's, it's a diverse multicultural Asian society. Uh, and Taiwan within at least Northeast Asia is quite unusual in using Asianness in that respect. Japan doesn't, Korea doesn't, China doesn't, Hong Kong doesn't. So just um, on Hong Kong, I mean, does, does Hong Kong use its uh, sort of British colonial history in a way to demonstrate some unique... Well, when we, when we talk about Hong Kong, we have to be aware of, you know, who has agency in Hong Kong. So um, does Hong Kong use its British heritage? Well, of course, the British heritage is there. It, it's something that, you know, can't be denied. But there's been a... Uh, a strong tendency when Hong Kong's history is discussed to lengthen it. Yeah. So the sort of colonial narrative of Hong Kong history is that Hong Kong history starts in 1839 with, or 1840 with the arrival of the British. You know, that's the beginning. Mm. Um, and if you go to Singapore, that's, well, at least until recently, that's been pretty much how they tell, still tell the story of Singapore. You know, it begins in 1819 with raffles. Mm. Now, in Hong Kong, that's not how the story is told now. Uh, it, it begins 5,000, you know, 5,000 mm. years ago. Uh, and, it's quite um, similar to Australia as well, and yeah. how Australia conceptualises yeah. the start and end of the start mm. of its history. Mm. Yes, except that Yes, the, the, pot, the, the, the power dynamics are a bit different in Australia. Um, yeah. Uh, because, yes, if you like, an indigenous discourse of Hong Kong history is, in, the, in that case, a tool for Chinese nationalism, for mm -hmm. the promotion of Chinese nationalism. Fascinating. But in, I, I mean, it, there's, so there's the British heritage in Hong Kong. There's also the Japanese heritage, mm -hmm. for better or arguably Rather, you know, more for worse, uh, the, the three years or three and a half years of, of Japanese occupation yep. Uh, yep, during course. the war. Uh, but actually also a very significant influence of Japan in post-war Hong Kong. Uh, so uh, during the Maoist era when Hong Kong, when, when Hong Kong was to some extent cut off from China, not entirely, but largely, which was Hong Kong's biggest trading partner, Japan. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the cultural influence of Japan on Hong Kong has been huge. But, you know, overall in East Asia, I mean, whether we're talking about Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China itself, Korea, you know, regionalism is remarkably weak. Um, uh, and we don't really have time to go into the detailed reasons for that. But one issue that's come up, which is relevant, is language education. So Tsubin mentioned that Taiwan has this project of becoming a bilingual society. What's the other language? English. Mm -hmm. What's the foreign language that all students in East Asia study at school? English. How many students in East Asian schools get the opportunity ever to study an Asian foreign language? Almost none. Mm -hmm. um, very, very few. Uh, 
Mm. Well, we might um, yeah, turn to, to Q&A, but that is a, such an interesting um, conversation. Uh, I have a question here, the first one for Kauri. Um, you mentioned the need uh, of minorities um, to be included more through the local level. Uh, how does that intervene with the national ideology or intention which is embedded in the national curriculum? Um, the National Curriculum Guideline is a very vague document. So they will say that representations of the community member, they may say that the representation of the community had to be reflected in what the school do. So then the school and the local government can argue that, well, the, the community includes lots of migrants, a Korean background and so on, and therefore we will include the, the voices of these people. So the, in, in that way, I find that the way in which local government and individual schools selectively and variously interpret the national directive in order to suit the local circumstance is quite in, ingenious. Some, some government does it more successfully than others. Osaka Metropolitan Government is very good at this. Interesting. Uh, we have a question here about Taiwan. So I might pass this one to, to you, Tsubin, uh, and then Ed for your comment, if you've got anything to add. Uh, but this is about multiculturalism. So we've actually got a couple of questions here about multiculturalism. Um, does, the Taiwan, uh, does the Taiwanese government's message of Taiwan as Asian and multicultural resonate with Taiwan's people, uh, the Taiwanese people's lived experiences, or is that more of a top-down approach? Uh, there's another question here, which is uh, to the ex asking about the extent to which um, Taiwanese students are taught about multiculturalism or are taught to be, uh, to, cons to consider themselves as part of a multicultural society. So I'll start with uh, you, Tsubin. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Currently in schools, multiculturalism is definitely political correctness. And uh, students, I think, are widely accept this kind of idea. Taiwan is a multicultural society. Even the even the advertisement from the government is trying to tell people that Taiwan is, is, is multicultural. We have indigenous, we have new immigrants. And just like I mentioned in the curriculum guideline, we even put the new immigrants language as a part of the primary uh, primary level uh, curriculum. And in, within two years time, the mother tongue, the dialects or Aboriginal languages will become compulsory for junior high and senior high. Hmm. Yeah, so all the way up there. And at the same time, like Ed just mentioned, English is again, um, are having more emphasis in schools ever. Because in the past, we have a subject called English. Now with so-called bilingual agenda, uh, students, they, they are not only learning Mandarin, they need to learn the, uh, the mother tongue, the dialects or Aboriginal languages. And now as English become bilingual, uh, different subject teachers, they need to use bilingual to teach. That means English and Mandarin. So, is how, how this, uh, so this, all this message coming to schools, teachers know that, yeah. And in fact, they have a very, the teachers in Taiwan, they do have a very high agency regarding their teaching. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the freedom of speech is, I mean, it's very high in Taiwan. So the teachers actually, they, different teachers, they give uh, students different ideas. And now we put, uh, with the new curriculum guideline, we put more and more emphasis on the criticality of students, uh, the value of different voices, and a, a more democratic approach to, to that, yeah. So, I mean, students in Taiwan, they, they accept this idea quite well, especially the younger generation. Yeah, Ed, did you have anything to add to that? There's one thing I could say, and actually with reference to Hong Kong, um, I mean, there's not so much of a discourse of multiculturalism in Hong Kong, uh, but there's always been this idea of Hong Kong as an international city. Hmm. Global. Uh, or, yeah. or global, global city. city. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I found when I lived there myself, and uh, I think this is basically still the case, that, that in many ways Hong Kong is quite inward looking. Hmm. 
Um, so there's this, this image that people have of Hong Kongers themselves have of Hong Kong as an international city. But it's almost like a kind of slogan uh, that everybody chants. But uh, in, in the way that people think and behave, they're not necessarily very international. Um, and we should remember that there are multicultural elements in Hong Kong society. So there's a long-standing Indian ethnic community, which owes its presence to evil British colonialism uh, originally. Uh, uh, there's also, of course, a substantial population of Filipinos. But who are they? Most of them are um, domestic workers um, who are brought in on special visas under very restricted conditions, whose wages are controlled by the government. Uh, you know, there are lots of other groups as well. Um, but uh, I think we need, we, this is something that as it, it's attracted increasing attention, to be fair, in Hong Kong in recent years. But it's something that's often overlooked within Hong Kong and, and by people looking at Hong Kong from outside. But, but um, you know, there are certainly these, the, the, the Filipinos and to some extent many of the South Asians in Hong Kong are underprivileged. Certainly the Filipinos, very much underprivileged and are, are really, you know, kind of exploited. Um, uh, so I think, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a dimension in Hong Kong that deserves more attention, not least through the education system in terms well, of the way that Hong Kongers are taught to mm. think of themselves. I think it's inter interesting that multiculturalism in Taiwan is, is, is allocated top down uh, in order to distinguish itself from PRC. Mm. Uh, Hong Kong advocating itself as an international city from top down in order to distinguish itself from PRC. But Japan, I guess, well, doesn't, doesn't have that need, I guess, for the time being. So the national government doesn't have a multicultural policy. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, what the, what's happening is the local government have multicultural policy. And then mm -hmm. they are the ones who create various uh, welfare or integration schemes and so on. So it's quite different. Whether this is a good thing or not has been debated. You know, like in Australia, should, Austra should Japan sh have a national top-down policy articulate itself, their own position, and then bring it forward? Or is that, then, so, so there is a, 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 a advocates for that position. But at the same time, some people, uh, other people argue that if the local government take, take them, they, they tend to develop the policies that are more suitable and appropriate to specific need of, of the uh, uh, cultural diversity. For instance, Ainu indigenous in Hokkaido and uh, uh, South Americans in vehicle manufacturing industry such as Toyota City and so on. So it's quite a different approach. Interesting. I think we've got time for one more question. This is quite an interesting question. It gets to some of, uh, I guess, what you were talking about, Ed, with the idea of the global city or Hong Kong as a, as a global um, city. Uh, and this is about the International Baccalaureate um, and whether or not the IB uh, curriculum uh, could promote the value of global citizenship in contrast to localised identity. Uh, and I've just, uh, yeah, so do curriculums in Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, contain such type of content about the global citizen. So if we could have uh, a minute each, uh, Kauri, what's, what's Japan? Is there global citizenry, citizenry content in the curriculum? But well, government talks about it. Global citizenship is a kind of buzzword among the educationalists uh, in Asia, in, in Japan as well. It's supposed to be convened, conveyed through the social studies um, courses and so on, and moral education. IB is not widely um, used in Japan. They're obviously, international schools use it, but, uh, but there are some schools which have uh, advocated IB in the Japanese language version, mm -hmm. but not to the same extent as in Hong Kong in an Australian private school. So in Taiwan, I mean, is there a, is there a global citizenry content um, that you can speak to? Yes, I mean, in the citizen uh, curriculum, this is definitely part of it. So like the SDGs, the, the 
uh, sustainable development goals actually is very popular as a topic to be discussed in social studies from primary level all the way up to university. So that's one thing. And talking about IB now, I mean, in Taiwan, slightly from Japan, uh, quite a few public schools, uh, junior high and senior high schools, they want to make themselves in, become IB school. They are public school, mm. they are state school. And they are funded by local authority to mark a milestone in, the, in, in, in that local authority's uh, area, saying that we have a in public international school rather than private ones. For example, Taipei and Taoyuan City both are competing to have the first IB state school. Okay. So Ed, I might give you the final word. Right, global citizenship. Well, I mean, one thing to say about global citizenship is that, uh, I mean, you know, on its own, it's a bit of a nebulous concept. How can it be operationalized? Well, to, to, to be uh, or to have a sense of yourself as a citizen of the world in any um, meaningful way, your local or national community needs to be recognized or needs to be part of a global community um, and you know this is of course a very sensitive issue in the case of Taiwan because Taiwan's not recognized um, you know, ta Taiwan is <laughs> kind of in that sense excluded from global citizenship or it's only uh, you know recognized avenue to um, membership of the global community it goes through Beijing uh, and ditto with Hong Kong. Um, but I mean, I, I would say that if we're talking about East Asia or indeed any region of the world, um, before we talk about global citizenship, which I think is, is important in many ways, because many problems that we face are global, right? Climate change, coronavirus, they are global problems. There are many global problems that we face. But in terms of dealing with whatever problems we face, what comes first? The local community, the nation, and then the region. And what is really missing in East Asia is any, as we've already mentioned, is, is any real sort of consciousness uh, of a regional identity or, or a sense that East Asians together share a common destiny and you know, hands across borders, we can work together uh, to uh, collaborate in facing our shared problems. That is totally absent. Uh, but, wouldn't that be, but I wonder whether this lack of uh, regionalism is, is partly to do with the, the political regimes are quite different. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. yeah I mean, there are, there are reasons that there, there are, yeah. it's, it's easy to understand, I think, in many yeah, ways why. Yeah, in particular in East Asia. That so it's not enough to moralize about this and say, isn't this yeah. terrible? Because well, yeah, we I mean, it. there is definitely the, 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 the line drawn in terms of political system, liberal democracy versus otherwise. Mm -hmm. So to, 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 to consider the long-term shared identity could be quite a challenge. Um, but I, yeah, you're right. But I think, but I think there's, there, is a, there are practical steps that governments and education systems could take uh, to promote greater sort of understanding and greater sort of shared identity. And one of those is the teaching of modern Asian foreign languages. Mm. Okay, I think we might have to leave it there. Maybe the steps is uh, a topic for a future webinar. <laughs> it sounds like another interesting discussion about how to go about strengthening East Asian regionalism. Uh, but I'm afraid that we are out of time. Uh, so I would like to thank our panellists uh, it's been an incredibly rich um, discussion. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, as somebody who um, doesn't sit within, within this discipline but has a, a strong interest in Asia. I found it an incredibly fascinating discussion. So thank you to our panellists uh, and thank you to our audience for watching this La Trobe Asia event. Uh, this webinar has been recorded. If you've registered for the event, you'll, you will be emailed the appropriate
links when they are ready. So please follow us on Twitter at Latrobe Asia or join our mailing list uh, to find out more details for online events and Latrobe Asia publications. But uh, thank you again to our panel. Uh, that was a terrific discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.